So this is topic one, and you can see that uh, the name of the topic is fundamental issues. So this is uh, the very foundation of this course, financial management. Right, so right, so uh, I think I explained already to you that you, your course assessment is based on three things. Uh, your fifty percent is your closed book exam, and forty percent is your group presentation. You come as a group, and then your ten percent is the activities that you do on the discussion forum. Uh, and then the same thing I wrote again. Uh, the first topic is the risk and return. Risk and return. Uh, rational firms and investors. In finance, we only consider those companies, those firms, those individuals who we consider are rational. Rationality is very important. The word rationality is connected with the debate we were having this uh, some time ago about the information, knowledge, understanding, intelligence, intellect. Rational is that you know what is good or what is bad for you. You make a logical, uh, in, uh, informed, and relevant decision. All right. In economics, in finance, we, uh, I'm sure you would have taken some, you must have taken some basic economics course in your high school or, you know, in junior studies. Uh, one of the assumption we have is that the consumers and the producers are rational. By rational means, a consumer will like to have the maximum satisfaction with the minimum cost. And the producer would like to produce the maximum with the minimum average cost. You will never like to buy the same thing at a higher price when you know that the same thing you can buy at a lower price. But if you buy the same product at a higher price, you are not a rational consumer. And same way, you are a producer. Your product is ready. You can sell it for 30 euros a piece. You know it. And the market price is 30 euros a piece. But you sell it for 20. It means that you are intentionally incurring a loss of 10 euros per, per piece. Whereas you could earn 30 euros. If you do this kind of behavior, if you have this kind of reactions, then you are not considered as rational investor. When you know that you can buy a stock cheaper and sell expensive, but what you do is you, you buy expensive and sell cheaper. This is not a rational behavior. So first of all, the first condition is that all the entities, all the individuals, companies, firms, hedge fund, trainees, they all have to be rational. Once again, by rationality means that they are able to make use of their common sense. They know what is good or bad for them. The rational firms or the individuals invest in the projects which yield you return higher than the minimum acceptable hurdle rate or the bottom line. Uh, when you want to invest, you must have certain minimum return which you must obtain. Now imagine, uh, I borrow from the banks and I invest in stocks. I borrow 1 million euros from different banks and the plan is that this borrowed money I would be investing in some stocks or in some property or wherever. And I calculate that the total 
cost of borrowing, which I pay to my bankers is around 5%, or let's say 5%. In that case, 5% is setting a bar or a bottom line or a hurdle. So when I borrow this money from the bank and I start investing in the different projects, one thing is there that the minimum return which I must be able to generate on my investment be more than 5%. Are you with me? Imagine I borrow money by myself at 5% and I invest 1 million euros, which I borrow. And after I invest 1 million euros, I get 4% return. Was it a rational decision? Hmm? Was it a rational decision? But how would you know that? I know I can go to the bank and I borrow 1 million euros. And then I start investing this 1 million euros in different investments. And let's say the return come after six months or after one year. How do I know right now that I would be in a position to get more than 5%? Look, I have to make a decision right now. See the reality. See, the, see from the practical point of view. I go to the banks. Today is 12th uh, January, uh, February. I go to the banks and I let's say that my loan is sanctioned the same day. And by the afternoon or 12th of February, I have 1 million euros in my bank. I wish I have. And then let's say I want to make a decision that by the evening, I would be investing in Nokia, in Finnair, in British Petroleum, in Microsoft, in Apple. I want to invest. And I, I also know that I must earn minimum 5%. Because that's my cost of borrowing. Whereas the actual return will come after one year or after six months. How do I know it? Well, we expect, we do the homework. We do the forecasting. We make some anticipation. All right. Now, you're not astrologers. You know, you know the fortune tellers, they can see your hand and tell you how much money will you earn in six months time? No, you will be doing a homework. And that techniques you will be learning in this course that how you can forecast your expected return, which you will be getting in the future. The reality may be exactly opposite, but that's a different thing. We always make some expectations, expectations, forecasting, anticipation. And that gives us some idea that I think this investment is a rational investor because I have a strong reason to believe that I would be earning 9% a year, whereas my cost of borrowing is 5% a year. If this is the case, why not go for it? Remember, when you are an entrepreneur, you are never sure of your actions. You, you know, <clears throat> when you start a shop, when you start a new venture, you know that today you have to spend a lot of money to start your business. The business will give you the return after a long time. Maybe for years and years and years, you only have to sp spend money in the business. All right. If you get so scared of this, this situation, then nobody would invest in the world. We always invest in anticipation, in the hope, expectation that yes, I know we are spending money now, but at the end of the day, we shall be getting enough of money that we are not only able to return money back to the bank and also give 5% interest, but also make lots of money. This is the phenomena. This is what we do in the financial markets. So there are some models which you will be studying in this course when you can make this kind of forecasting that what should you minimum get? So as a rational company, as a rational individual, you must get minimum the hurdle rate. And what is the word hurdle rate? Hurdle rate is something you must get the minimum. If you expect that you will be never able to get the hurdle rate of return, then give the money back to the bank and say with folded hands, sorry, we borrowed from you. And now we know that we will never be able to produce the, 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 the return. Uh, hands, please cancel my loan. <laughs> Or if you borrow from your friends, if you ask your people help, 
to you know your friends to help you give the money back with lots of thanks uh, and make an open confession that I think we shall not go, go for this project. We are unable to do it because uh, there's no reason to believe that we shall be able to get more than 5%. Mm -hmm. Confession is very important in finance. With your head high, say it loud and clear that this project is no longer viable. So make sure that the investments, you, the projects which you undertake, uh, they are rational choices. Mm -hmm. The hurdle rate is the minimum return which the investors must get. I was about to say it before, but now it's clear here. Uh, the hurdle rate is the minimum rate of return that investors should get. Is it should get or must get? It's must get. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of you have to. Uh, when you are a company and when you make some investments, do you invest in all the projects or in all the companies which have the equal level of risk? Or does your project or investments differ in, in terms of risk profile? Hmm? Or by the way, uh, if not one firm, if you want to invest in Nokia, or let's say, let's say, let's say Walmart, and and Walt Disney, both American companies, you think they all they are they both are equally risk related? Do they have the same level of risk? No. The companies and the projects within a company, they differ in terms of risk uh, profile. The different companies' projects and the different companies have the different risk profile. All right, uh, please don't get confused what I'm saying. First of all, two companies are different in terms of their riskiness. As I said, Walt Disney and Walmart what do you, who do you think is more risky? You know Walt Disney? They make these entertainment prod products. They are in the media world. And then you have Walmart. They are the retail. Who do you think is riskier than other and why? How many, have you heard about the Walt Disney, by the way? Walt Disney is a, is it a media company or Netflix, for example? Have you heard Netflix? Okay, I repeat, uh, I revise my example. Uh, Netflix and Walmart. Which of the two company is riskier? No, I mean, who do you think apparently is riskier than other? Netflix? You think Netflix is riskier than Walmart? Uh, any reason for this? Why Netflix is riskier than Walmart? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, okay. Any other reason? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Maybe because uh, Netflix is uh, there uh, producing uh, films like for fun, and Walmart is uh, for or more like necessities yeah yeah uh, I, I the humans always like to fulfill the necessities first if you have very less money in your wallet uh, the first thing you would like to have some food and then think about entertainment isn't so so yes you're right so apparently uh, netflix is riskier than walmart and remember walmart is a company which sells you the retail products right and the retail product is that there's no problem of cash. You just, you will not have your bag from the till point unless you pay with your card or pay cash. So everything is cash based. And in Walmart, you only buy the necessities basically. All right. So apparently the Walmart seems to be uh, less risky than the, than the other company, Netflix. So if you want to invest in Walmart and Netflix, you may have different risk 
profile. Now, let's talk about Walmart. Walmart is now going to spend on two projects. Now forget about Netflix altogether. No Netflix around. Only Walmart. And you all agreed, I hope that Walmart is not a risky company. Yeah? Walmart has two projects. The one project is that they would be having a few sh more shelves. You know, when you go to the store, they will have new shelves. And on the new shelves, they would be having uh, some baby food. That's the project one, that in every new Walmart store, they would be having a fresh new shelf where they would be displaying the baby, the child food, you know. The second project is that Netflix, it, uh, <laughs> Walmart, Walmart is going to develop a software for its uh, cash transaction. You know, when you, when you have a till machine, there's a software. They want to develop a software. So now the so-called less risky company, Walmart, have two projects within the same company. One is about having a new shelves of baby food and the second one is developing a software. Please tell me which project is risky than other. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's in the US, let's say, you're right, it depends upon country. Uh, but let's say for the sake of argument, let's say it's, it's U USA where we're talking about. Mm -hmm. the, the software is more risky because uh, this is not their core business. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think that it should take more money than make itself. There more, more money to be more capital. Let's imagine both project costs same. Let's imagine that both projects cost same amount. Yes, anybody else? Could you see a lot of return of investment and add value to the company? Mm -hmm. Then I think that more software is more risky here. Well, the point is risky, riskiness. I'm not saying which will be giving you more return. But the point I'm focusing is that when you see the riskiness of the two projects undertaken by the one company, the company's name is Walmart. It sells retail food, retail thing. Food is also retail item. Child food, the baby food. We have babies. In the US, there is no shortage of babies. And all the babies eat baby food. You can't give them the adult food. So if there are children, they would be eating child food. And considering that the people go to Walmart because it's the biggest chain store, the probability is that not all the babies would start consuming the baby food double, nor they would stop consumption at all. So there will be a consistent cash flow to Walmart. On the other hand, if Walmart is developing its new R&D, a new software, you're right. R&D development is not the core business of Walmart. Moreover, even if Walmart is developing its new software, the softwares are risky investment because it's not a guarantee that software would work also. Are you with me? You develop a software, you know, uh, when you see all these iPhone and uh, you know, all these new gadgets, we only see those softwares which have been successful. There must be many, many softwares which people, the companies invested millions and billions and they were never successful. Just because we don't know about them doesn't mean that all the softwares are success. The probability of success to Walmart in having the new shelves for the baby food, the probability of success is higher, hence the risk is lower. And now we're talking about only one company. Earlier, you were comparing Walmart with Netflix. But now you're only comparing two projects within the same company. So no two companies would be same in terms of their 
riskiness all right and when you are when you are expecting a return from them then you add different amount of risk premium i want to give you an example imagine uh, the hurdle rate by the way is calculated like the hurdle rate uh, is equal to risk less rate uh, let's call it risk free rate plus risk premium risk free rate before i go the i take the discussion further i want to ask you is there is there anything riskless in life riskless return look at the word i'm using riskless rate or riskless rate of return or risk free rate of return is there anything in life which is risk free which has no risk hmm? well there are the government is the least risky entity the companies can become bankrupt but the states normally never become bankrupt even they are close to bankrupt they can be bailed out in the if you look at the economic history of the world in the last 20 years or even less uh, greece was almost you know some i'm talking about 2004 5 when uh, soon after greece organized these athens olympics and there was a big problem big economic problem in greece there were problems in, in Irish economy. There was tremendous problems there. There was problem in Portugal, Spain, and then there were, uh, before that, you must be very young then, there was 1997, there was a huge banking crisis in Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Taiwan. It was completely, you know, the entire banking failure, the currencies depreciated, there was no money left for the banks. Okay. They were countries. They survived. If they were companies, what would have happened? They would have become bankrupt. <coughs> you get my point? So therefore, because the countries have more resources than the companies. And one resources, one resource that the country has but the company doesn't have is what well tax is also one but if if there's no income with the people they will not pay tax the country has a printing press you know printing press what do you do in the printing press print yes you print more money in the as a last resort when the country is nearly uh, on the verge of bankruptcy and you can just ask your uh, central bank of the country that hey could you please print some more money <laughs> a more means a few billion dollars or something like that so that is a luxury which the countries have but the companies don't have potentially all these countries which i mentioned if there were companies, they could have been decimated, disappeared from the, from the financial world or to any world for that matter. All right. So that is why the state is considered the riskless entity. In theory, states can also become bankrupt, but in reality, they are bailed out. Okay. Therefore, the bills, the bonds, the securities which are issued by the state are riskless. Right? Have you seen that the Bank of Finland or any any uh, the country where you come from, uh, they issue some securities, but they are considered as a safe investment because the state will pay you back. But if you invest in some company's stocks, no matter how. Uh, credible how reputed the company is there's always some risk that the company would default and you may not get your money back therefore the 
the return which you get from the state securities is called riskless investment. But because there is a no risk, not, not low risk, but no risk, therefore, the return is very, very low. I mean, nowadays, I'm yet to see any OECD country where you invest in the state security and you get more than 0.5% rate of return. It's very low, very, very low. On the contrary, let's say you talk about some company. Let's say Netflix. <coughs> Sorry. Risk-free rate, maybe still 0.5%. But maybe you put 7% premium. Premium is that the compensation for the extra risk. If you have a choice to invest in the US securities and Netflix, where do you think is the safe investment you have? Obviously the state, but then the state will pay you very less return. But if you want to invest in Netflix, then you ask for extra premium. What is premium? Premium is the reward or the compensation for the risk you undertake. And as this risk become higher and higher, you demand more and more compensation. And this compensation is called risk premium. Now, uh, let's talk about Walmart. Maybe for Walmart, you have this hurdle rate. Walmart is less risky than Netflix. So you can see that you are, de you are demanding less than 7.5%, right? But Walmart is still a private company. So it's riskier than risk-free rate. All right, so the different investments you can rank according to riskiness. And based on the riskiness, you are demanding the risk premium. Here, the risk premium is zero. Yeah. Here, the risk premium is 0 0.5 plus zero. Yeah. Why so? Because state is riskless. There's no risk. Whereas when you go to the private sector, you start demanding the premium on top of risk free rate. And this premium depends upon, in case of Walmart, for example, is 5%. This is not true, but I'm just making some kind of my own judgment. 5%, whereas for Netflix, this is 7%. So the bottom line is that higher the risk, higher is the expected return. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, we're assuming this uh, additional premium. Mm -hmm. How we assume it? Uh, so we can make even 6 6 well, because we are in the very early stage and I'm not discussing it yet, but in the same topic, we shall study, we shall study a model called CAPM, capital asset pricing model, which exactly gives you how much you should. So everything would become true, real. We'll come to that stage. But I'm just saying for the sake of saying that my, my, my inclination, my expectation is that Netflix is riskier than Walmart. Hence, the risk premium, whatever this amount is, uh, at least I'm not worrying about seven or five, but what I'm, what I'm very sure is that this will be higher than this. And for state, the risk premium is zero because state is a riskless entity. Uh, why does risk premium differ from firm to firm? Well, I would even say that the risk premium can differ even in the same firm from a project to a project. Remember the example I gave you of Walmart uh, planning to invest uh, for the baby food shelves or developing a software. So the company was same, but if you see from this point of view, this premium would be higher on the R&D project, whereas this premium would be lower 
on the uh, on this baby shell baby food shelves project okay remember that uh, it's very important for you to know that the collection of projects is called a firm mm -hmm. what is a firm a firm is a collection of several projects okay what is industry industry is a collection of several firms what is a sector sector is a collection of different various industries what is economy economy is a collection of different sectors so we start from very micro level uh, investment called project from project to firm from firm so if i have to make some kind of uh, uh, pyramid then we start from the project and from the projects we have we have firms from firms we have the industries i don't know what it looks like <laughs> and from industries we have the sectors and from sectors we have the economy this is a very macro you know the micro and macro in e economics yeah so economy is a very macro unit whereas a firm or a project is a very micro unit okay if in a country the projects fail the companies fail then and if companies fail the industry fail and then the sectors fail and if the sectors fail then the whole economy fail so this is like a knock on impact something happens here and that have a uh, you know complete impact on the rest of the economy hmm? and the second question i asked you here was why does even low risk firm has higher hurdle rate than risk less rate can you see this example here if you look at the second green question a high risk company have high premium but the second question is why does even low risk firm has higher hurdle rate than risk less rate can you see this here on this chart can you see this example in this example walmart is a safe company but even this company has a risk premium which the state doesn't have because there's a difference between the company owned by the private sector and the state institution definitely the state institution is safer uh then the private organization so that makes a difference little bit of history there is an article uh, which i have uploaded in optima you can see it mm, should i show it to you it's here mm, research articles uh triumph of the optimist it's a very interesting article you must go through it and i took a table from this article and which is here and the article says something very interesting information imagine somebody invested money in 1901 let's say 1 dollar how much will it be in 2001 so just based on your retrospection analysis 
If you had invested $1 in the treasury bill in America, you would have got on an average 4% a year. So imagine you invest $1 in 1901, then the average rate of return in America, sometime up, sometime down, would be 4%. All right. And if you have had invested in the government bonds, in $1 in 1901, it would have grown at 5.5% a year. And if you had invested in the common stock, common stock is the, the shares like in Walmart, Netflix, in the private sector, it would have grown 11.1%. But remember, this will never be smooth every year. Sometime 20%, next year minus 5%. Ups and downs. And what is the, based on this chart, what was our conclusion? Our conclusion was that higher is the return when higher is the risk. Even historically, based on last 100 year, our concept is proved that the common stock are the riskiest investment and they have the highest return and the bills are the least risky and they have the least return. A small uh, addition to your information, your knowledge, I use two words, bills and bonds. Yeah treasury bills, which are also the government bills, and then the government bonds, you can also call them treasury bonds, it doesn't matter. Whenever I use the word treasury, it basically means the state, the government. Mm -hmm. Bills are, any idea who are bills? Bills and bonds. Bills are those which mature within a year. Mm -hmm. Mature means, imagine I'm representing state and I come to you, let's say I represent Bank of Finland uh, and I come to you that, hey, please folks, would you like to invest? Can I borrow money from you? Each of you give me one euro, but your money would be returned before 365 days. Mm -hmm. Why 365 days? Because in finance, <coughs> sorry, in finance, we have the short period and long period. Short period is the period which is under 365 days, 365 days. And long period is 365 and above. All right. So if I borrow from you for three months, six months, nine months, this will be called a bill, treasury bill. But let's say I borrow from you for a year and a half or even 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. It is called government's bonds. Okay. Can you see one thing? The bill rate is lower than the bond rate. The reason is that even though both are issued by the state, bill interest is lower than the bond interest. Why so? Because in the bond interest, in the bonds, you borrow for more than one year. Longer you borrow, higher is the risk. Imagine I asked you, hey folks, can, you, can I borrow some money from you? Um, one option is that I borrow from you now and return tomorrow. The second is that I borrow from you today and return after one month. If you agree to lend me money, which option you will prefer? Which option will you prefer? Tomorrow. Why so? It's secure. Exactly. So the, the risk is low. Since the risk is low, then the return should also be low. 
Therefore, on the short-term borrowings, it, it's possible that the return is low because risk is low. You know what, even though you can argue that what is the risk? Both are issued by the state. No, there is a risk because in the long period, even the states have a chance to get bankrupt or face some economic crisis. You know, the states can also face some economic challenges in the long term. Who would ever imagine that uh, if you look at the, uh, the world economy in 1990s or 1995, I know many of you were not even born then. The stock markets were going up, you know, shooting the stock prices. IT industry is booming. There are some young people in the early 20s becoming millionaire, multimillionaire, because they knew technology, they knew the uh, developing softwares. The companies were getting richer, the stock price were going up like anything. All right, nobody ever imagined that there will be a year 2007 when things will be completely opposite. Stock markets will crash. Banks would be having no money. The resources would be completely dry up. Investors would be so pessimistic. The markets would crash. Nobody would believe. Many countries would have the problem that they can almost be declared bankrupt. And the same countries, the same economies, the same, same stock exchanges, they were minting money during the 90s. Nobody ever imagined. So in the long period, even the state securities can become insecure to pay you back. All right. Therefore, uh, many investors prefer the short-term borrowing rather than the long-term borrowing. All right. And then you must know that there is a in real uh, growth rate also. Okay. Uh, the real was that. Um, now, this is some side information. Imagine. I have a deposit in the bank. And the bank give me, give me a promise that they would pay me 2% rate of interest a year. Okay. And let's say inflation is 3%. Am I getting richer or poorer? The bank says that it will pay me 2% rate of interest, but the inflation in the country is 3%. What is my real situation? Hmm? My bank deposit is multiplying. Every year I get 2% increase. I should be happy about it, shouldn't I? Then what I'm scared of? Hmm? The inflation. So my wealth is increasing by 2%, but my wealth is also decreasing by 3%, because when the inflation takes place, the value of the money goes down. So on the one hand, the interest rate is 2%, but the inflation is making it minus 3%. So overall, I'm losing 1% of my wealth. This difference between the actual nominal interest rate and the inflation rate is called a real interest rate. All right? So you can forecast or you can make a formulation that during this 100 years in America, uh, 4 minus 1.1 is equal to 2.9. So on an average, on an average, the inflation was 2.9%. Can I say it? So you earn 4% minus 2.9% of inflation and you get 1.1% as a real rate of return. All right. So even though your bank deposit increased by 4%, but actually the real, in terms of notes, the money multiplied. But when you go to buy shopping, you have to pay more money to buy the same thing because the value of the money is going down. 
And how do you know it? Simple formula, the nominal interest rate minus inflation rate. And because here the real rate, so the real rate is Let me write it down. The real interest rate is the nominal rate. Nominal rate is what the bank promised to pay you. Let's say it's 5% or let's say 2%, sorry. Minus inflation rate. Let's say 3%. Therefore, the real interest rate would be actually minus 1%. Apparently, apparently it looks that you are earning more money. But as a matter of fact, you're losing value of money. Nowadays, if you keep your money in the banks, uh, believe me, in most of the countries, you're losing money because no, no bank is giving you more than 1%, but the inflation could be 2%. So it means you're losing money. So for the, for the last many, many years, the real interest in many, especially in the Western societies, uh, the, the interest, even the nominal interest rate is something around 0%. So if in a country, like, like in Finland, the interest rate is approximately 0%, but the inflation is around 1%. It means that if you keep money in the bank, you are not getting richer. Your wealth is, how to say, is evaporating. You know, the money is <laughs> going away, right? It doesn't look because the amount of money remains same, but the value of the money goes down. Like, like we have something called uh, money illusion. There is a phenomena, even though this we study in economics, but it's called money illusion or it's also called wage illusion. Do you know what is meant by illusion? Illusion is, what is the word? There's a word for it. Something similar when you have some kind of, when you feel that something is there, but something is not there. When you have some nightmares, dreams that and you start living, even the real life, you think that, oh, there's a word called hallucination, hallucination or something. Huh? Say again? Mirage. mirage. Yeah, mirage is also a word. Uh, hallucination is a word. Illusion is a word. Something you think exists, but doesn't exist. You know, it's a psychological problem. <laughs> uh, we, the rational people, so-called rational, companies and rational human beings. We also have the money illusion or wage illusion. We think that the money is multiplying. Why this is called wage in uh, illusion? Because normally the workers have this problem, the, the, the one who work in the factories. What happens? They think that their wage rate is low. And then some leftist trade unionist comes in the picture and he says that, hey, Let's ask the management that our wage should increase. Our family, we're not able to feed our families. Our, wa our wage is too low. It should be increased. The management says, no way. We will not give you any wage increase. Look, we don't have many orders now. Market is going down. Why should we give you wage hikes? Then the workers go on strike. Mm -hmm. After many, many days or weeks or months, one day the management decides, all right, fine, we will give you the wage increase. We increase your wage by 5%. Workers are very happy, are they? Well, they have a reason to be happy, but the management is very clever. They give them 5% increase in the wages. It means that their wage bill cost will go up by 5%, the cost of production will go up by 5%. The price they charge in the market will go up by 5%. When one company, one industry increase the price by 5%, this will have an impact 
impact on the other companies and they will also start increasing their cost and prices by 5%. Guess what happens? You have a bigger wallet now, but since the overall increase of price in the economy is by 5%, your real purchasing power is same as before, or maybe even worse. It could be that inflation is 7%. You got your price, you got your wage hike by 5%, whereas the inflation could be 6%, 7%. So you are, uh, you are worse off than before, even though your wallet is heavier than before. That is why Many uh, investors and many, uh, especially the, uh, the consumers and the producers, we have this problem called uh, an illusion. It's an illusion. We don't see that side unless somebody makes some calculation. Hey, are you happy? Yes, I'm happy. My wage increase is increased by 5%. Come on. Inflation is increased by 7%. Mm -hmm. And these are, uh, once again, the risk premium do you know the risk premium? Remember the risk premium? Yeah. Risk premium percentage. Can you see that? And you can see that once again for the last 100 years, there is a risk premium in the different countries. So you can see that in Denmark, uh, if somebody would invest in the equities, uh, they would demand for the whole 100 years, they would be demanding a risk premium around 4% a year. Let's say uh, in Denmark, the, the risk-free rate is 1%. It means that every investor, well, the average investor would demand 5% uh, by investing in the equity stocks. But as you can see from the countries, Belgium, Switzerland, for the last 100 years, Italy has to pay the highest risk premium. Mm -hmm. uh, riskiness, the stock price is more volatile, is more fluctuating. That is the reason. In the country, yeah. So this is like a, each figure shows how much risk premium you need to pay to convince your investor to invest and higher the risky higher the uh, riskiness of the economy higher would be the risk premium you pay it means that the investors in italy for the last 100 years they felt that this is very risky to invest in the company shares whereas the least has been in denmark around 4% which is Okay, but not so big. Whereas in Italy, it's over 10%. It means that if somebody invests, uh, if the Italian state gives you 1% risk-free rate, but then, some, then comes some Italian company, you'll be demanding 11%, one plus 10. So the state can borrow from you at 1%, but the private company has to offer you 11%. Why so? Because you think that private companies are most likely to, or there's a probability that they will not pay you the money back. So you feel insecure. And to compensate you for this insecurity, this riskiness, they have to pay you the cost of risk called risk premium. Yeah, make sense? Is anything unclear so far? Can you understand my language? Are we? Are you understanding what I'm speaking? It's very important that we we understand. We we speak the same language. Uh, it's very important. And as I said before, that if at any stage you find uh, it complicated, just raise hand. You don't have to wait till I finish. Just stop me then and there. Okay. Uh, okay. So we carry on. Uh, there are several factors which can make a company's investment risky or less risky. 
Okay, let's have some discussion about it. Please tell me, if you want to invest your money in the companies, what factors you think can make your investment uh, highly risky or low risky? So what factors you think, because after all, when I use the word riskiness, riskiness is not some divine power. Riskiness depends upon some realities. So which are the realities which can make something low risky or more risky? That's my point. So what do you think? Which factors contribute to riskiness? Mm -hmm. Sorry? Developments. Uh, can you please say more about it? Mm -hmm. no, that, that's, that's fine. So if you make more innovation, there's more development, then the project is less risky. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Very good. Mm. For instance, uh, I don't know whether you know, but a few years ago, not a not few years ago, maybe last year, I, uh, I invited somebody from Nordea Bank. You know Nordea Bank yes. in the city center? Uh, there's a leading um, uh, Finnish and, well, I would say Nordic Bank. Nowadays it's Finnish Bank because it has moved its headquarters from Stockholm to, Oslo, uh, to, to, to Helsinki. Uh, we had the executive of Nordea Bank here and he said, that nowadays when Nordea Bank gives loan to the companies, the very important factor they keep in mind is that, is this investment going to cause any climate issues? You know? So it means that if any project is going to add any climate threats, they don't give loans straight away. Now imagine you start a mining company, right? And you are asking me, Shab, we have started a mining company. Would you like to invest in our shares? I will demand a huge risk premium from you. First of all, I will not be able to, I will not be willing to invest in your project because uh, it's not a very, uh, there are many reasons. Uh, moreover, the, the, the carbon, uh, fuel consumption is now shrinking because now we are going more for the electric things. You know, the Tesla has changed the rules now. Uh, and on top of that, I know that the bank has also refused you to give loans because I know Nordia doesn't give loan for these uh, mining kind of uh, industries. Then I would be demanding a high risk premium from you. Because nowadays, people who demand products from the mining industry are very few. The consumption of the mining industry based products is shrinking. Moreover, there are no growth, as this gentleman said, uh, the development, okay, uh, there is no more possibility of development of mining based projects. All right, uh, then I would be demanding for me, uh, I would not invest in the mining company, or if I invest, I would demand a huge risk premium from you. All right. <laughs> it's difficult to say. Maybe I don't invest at all. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, what else? That's, that is a good point. So if something you are planning to invest, which has no demand or the demand is shrinking, why should you invest? Could be possible that you don't get your proper return. All right, what else makes a project less risky and more risky? And as I said, never feel shy from answering in the class. Don't worry, yes. Say again? Nurture? Nurture? What is Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You mean that if the cost is going to increase in the future, then the return will be down and we should demand more risk premium, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I get some idea that if in the future the cost is going to increase, the project, the cost will go up, then the project is risky, yeah? Yeah. And if the project is risky, then I've, yeah, yes, that's a good point. Imagine you want me to invest in a company uh, who's, I have no idea that how the cost of the project will look like in the future. And there's a very high chance that cost will increase. And that can put me in danger. And then I would place, I would put uh, more risk premium to it. And if I know that uh, the cost will not, there is no real reason to expect the cost to go up, then I would put low risk premium on it. Example, uh, I know many of you live in Coas apartments. Do you? <laughs> many of you live, I know. Um, for Coas, the operating cost is very low. Yeah, uh, uh, there are not many people working in the Quas um, main office in the in the city center, so salary bill is low. All right, and one or two or three janitors who come for the repair thing, they can manage hundreds of apartments. No, not a big deal. So the Quas operating cost is very low on day-to-day -day basis. On daily basis, the cost they incur on their expenses is very less. If I'm an investor, I would be very happy to invest in Coas because their existing cost level is low, which is good for me. I want to invest in the companies whose operational cost is low so that they can get more profits. More profits means I get more return from them. I not only see the Coas cost of production, uh, sorry, operating, uh, Operational cost is low, but I can also see that their cost will not rise in the near future because most of the apartments are new. In Finland, it doesn't, if you, if you are spending your money in the property business, uh, normally uh, it takes 15, 20 years before you have to remove the pipes or something like that. So they are comparatively new apartments. There's not going to be big expenses in the 15, 20 years from now. So I have a good reason to believe that in the next 15, 20 years, there is not going to be a huge increase in the cost of Coas company. And if I'm an investor, I would be very happy to invest in Coas because risk is low. And as uh, uh, this young lady said, that the demand also have a factor on the risk. Uvascula is a student city. There's always a housing shortage in the city. The students' apartments are cheaper comparatively to the, to the private, uh, you know, in the, in the normal market, rent is high, but the, maybe you are aware already that the, the apartments which you get from Coas are very subsidized, very cheaper. And the demand in the near future that the students will come from all the countries to study uh, in Finland uh, is quite high. So on the one hand, there is a guaranteed, or if not guaranteed, but there is a very assured increase in the revenue of Coas. On the other hand, it seems that the cost will not rise in the future, at least not in the near future. This makes Quas a good investment. Assured revenue and assured increase in the revenue and assured decrease in the cost. What else you want in life as an investor? 
what an investment. Love to buy the stocks of such company. Mm -hmm. Good point. Anything else? Which make the project or the investment risky or less risky? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 If the same housing company, Coas, are planning to build new apartments in your hometown, then the company is same, but the project is different. Yeah. Then for this new project, I would put high risk premium because of the reason you said. So there could be possibility that within the same company for the different projects, the risk premium is different, right? Okay, so the riskiness uh, of the company's projects depend upon several reasons. And one important reason which you bear in mind is the capital structure. Capital structure. You know what is capital structure? The capital structure includes debt and equity. Debt and equity is called capital. And by capital means financing of the firm. Capital is meant to finance the firm. And the most common ways to finance the company is debt and equity. Uh, I want to keep you, I want to give you an example. Example of, let's say I want to play, uh, I want to make a role play in the class now. Imagine. I want to launch a firm and I come to you and I say, Hey, my potential would be investors. Would you like to invest in my company? Would you like to become my investors? All right. Half of you say that yes, we will invest. We will invest in your equity. Then my question is, if you agree to invest in my equity, who are you? What is going on in your mind? What are your investment characteristics? Well, I can make your life easy. First of all, you will only like to invest in the equity. Remember, there's a risk of equity. The risk is that if the company is very successful, your share of profits will be huge. So the company's success would be shared with you. But if company is unsuccessful, disastrous, you would lose everything you invest in the company. It means who are you? You have some risk appetite. You like to take risk. Not only that you like to take risk, you like my idea. You like my idea. You, you believe in my idea. And you have done your homework and you're very confident that I think this project would be success. And once the project becomes successful, the company will have more profits and hence you will have more profits to share with. Half of you decide they want to invest in equity, but half of them, you know what? They say that Shab, we like your idea, this, that, 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 but you know what? We, we don't want to invest because to us, it seems to be risky. You know, proposition. And you are half of you this side, you're about to leave and say that, sorry, 
good luck they, they say good luck to you okay hope your project is success and you get your money back but unfortunately we we can't take so much of risk we are leaving and just when you guys are about to leave i say hey, wait, 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 wait sit for 30 seconds more and i say i have an offer for you you give me your money you invest your money but not in the equity but in the debt which means that i take this money from you as a loan regardless of my project is successful or a failure i would give your money back plus the interest so don't care about riskiness it's my problem i would pay you uh, your amount you pay you give me plus the let's say 5% rate of interest but if my company becomes super successful and i have millions of profits don't ask me more i will still pay you 5% then they people would be the beneficiary they they took risk not you guys but if my project is a complete failure then well my sympathy for them but for you people i assure you that i would give your money back plus i would give you interest and imagine that you start you calm down and you sit down at least you have no business risk now of course i can still become banker but but you feel more secure now all right so i start collecting the money from you from equity and the debt this combination of debt and equity is called capital structure and the total money which i collect from you is called capital so every company's total capital has debt capital and equity capital all right you get my point if you look at the i would show you uh, in the future not today but in the future i would show you some companies uh, the real companies real data that every company in the world uh, they have debt and equity depends upon investors if investors are willing to take risk they prefer equity but those who want to play safe they spend they they invest in debt because all the no investors no two investor in the world have the same profile we differ in the profile some investors are very risk lovers they invest in equity but some are extremely extremely risk haters well they can still invest in debt and when i collect this money from equity and the debt holders and pool it together that becomes my total capital equity capital capital is also called my internal capital why i call it internal because this becomes company's capital and the company is not supposed to return it to you if the company becomes bankrupt you can't sue the company hey give our money back well it's your risk your problem but if the company is in trouble and they come to me hey give our money back i have to give them you get my point this is why debt is a form of external capital whereas equity is a internal capital all right and both are the sources of companies finance finance what's the definition of finance finance is the sources where money comes from money comes from debt and equity so this side of the company is called financing side the question is what would i do with this money what would i do this money i would invest very good therefore the one side is company's financing now you gave me money i put this money together i start investing in the projects assets i start buying machinery technology uh, equipment land 
everything. That is called my assets. All right? And the assets are called investing. All right? So what is the difference between financing and investing? Financing is where money comes from. Money come from debt and equity. What is investing? Where money goes to? Where money goes to? To invest in assets. It's like a traffic. Something comes, something goes. Two way traffic. Financing is money comes from. Investing is money goes to. You get money from an equity holders and then you start investing in buying assets of the company machinery r d uh, technology piece of land office equipment all right all these things are your assets does it make sense so if somebody asked you what is financing well financing is where money comes from and what is investing where money goes to simple How many of you have studied accountancy or accounting before? Hmm? Have you? Have you studied accounting? Yeah. Well, you are studying. Yeah. No. In, in any company, in every company, there is something called balance sheet. Have you heard the word balance sheet? The balance sheet is The one side of the balance sheet is what business owe. Oh, you know, owe? what you owe to others. Well, you owe money to whom? You means the company. The company owes money to debt holders and equity holders. For example, if I borrow some money from you, it means I owe you money. All right, it's my liability. It's a burden on me, yeah, because I have to clear it. But when I get this money and I start investing in the assets, then I own, I own these assets. So what you own, you mean the business, what business own is called assets and what business owe is called liability therefore the debt and equity both are liabilities of course debt is a internal liability and uh, sorry equity is internal liability and debt is external liability all right and when you have this money Let's and then uh, when you have this, let's say I have $40 uh, euros of debt and I have 60 euros of equity. Let's say my total capital is 100 euros or my total financing is 100 euros. With this, I buy building with 50 euros. I wish I could buy a building with 50 euros. Let's say 50 million. I buy some furniture for 10 euros and I invest in the project for 40 euros. The project, building, furniture, they all are company's assets. Assets means the company own them. They are company's property and it's called assets. So assets are investments, right? Well, that's now you're going to deeper. I'll come to that later on. They are the short term liabilities and the long term liabilities. Yeah. But basically, uh, this is the definition of a balance sheet. You not only see the balance sheet. If you look at this thing, this is money comes from. So the liability side of the balance sheet tells you 
the money comes from or capital or financing the asset side shows you the money goes to you because you are buying now the money is going out of the business because when you buy a building or a plant equipment you have to pay the money goes out the money leaves and when money leaves it become asset okay but the point i'm trying to make at this point is that you should be in a position to understand this concept called capital structure capital structure underlines financing all right and um, as irina said uh, the capital structure is a combination of debt and equity equity you believe my idea you have a faith that when you invest you will be in a position to multiply your money but believe me you are taking a risk debt they like me they believe me but they still are not confident enough they think that debt is less risky than equity because if the company drops in value you will get nothing but they will still get something that's why they want to play safe so it means that debt and equity also shows the love for risk of investors those who love comparatively more risk would invest in equity and those who have less love for risk or no love for risk would like to invest in debt okay uh, for today this is enough so thank you so much uh, for coming today and taking this course uh, but one thing uh, i strongly recommend you that that when you finish the lecture and you go home uh, if the need be watch the videos the this video which I, i would be sharing with you but do your homework the same day because if you think that oh yes the lecture is now next week and i i shall study after four or five days uh there is a chance that you will forget things so do your work the same day whatever i teach you do on the same day at home all right and and if the need be as i said watch the video that can help you to understand things again once again thank you so much and welcome you all